there was a time when the earth was dark. It was an age of grinding poverty, disease, and death. The common people were illiterate. They lived in fear of the judgment and hell. The state church controlled all aspects of life, from birth until death. And for a price, the priest assured a better afterlife. But this all changed with a new dawn in England. Minds were awakened, and once the flame of the Reformation was lit, it was never to be put out again. This is a story of courage and fortitude against all odds, the burning of heretics and those who risk their lives to follow the light. It is a struggle of ideas about men's souls, their dreams, and the purpose in life. The state church responded by hunting down anyone who supported these radical new beliefs to put them to death. Join us as we uncover the heroic lives of those who led out in this movement and changed the world forever. This is the story of Light Unshackled. In the first century AD, a new religion swept across the Roman Empire. One man, with a simple life and profound teachings, transformed the world of his day. His name was Jesus Christ. He claimed to be the Son of God and shared a message that changed lives and gave hope to many. Paul, who at first bitterly persecuted this new religion, was brought face to face with Christ during a miraculous encounter. Shocked to think that he might be fighting on the wrong side, he re-studied the scriptures. As the word illuminated his mind, he became convinced that this was truth. He dedicated the rest of his life to spreading this message. He traveled 10,000 miles on foot and thousands more by ship as he carried the message of Christ across the Roman Empire. In Rome, these new teachings were not popular. Christianity, by its very nature, demanded exclusive worship of the God of Heaven. Pagan deities from the surrounding tribes in Asia Minor fit well alongside the Roman gods of Juno, Neptune, and Mars. Even some of the emperors were considered gods. But Christians called these pagan deities false gods. It's not hard to imagine why Christianity became very unpopular within pagan Rome. Thus begin generations of persecution. A battle raged between culture and scripture, paganism and truth. Such philosophies cannot coexist any more than can darkness and light. And so Paul was arrested, carried down this road to await trial in Rome. Paul was kept under house arrest for two years till his trial. Once condemned, he was transferred to the Mamertine prison to await his execution. We're standing in the Mamertine prison. It's incredible to think that right here was where Paul sat awaiting his execution. It's dark, it's damp. This was not a place where you wanted to be for any period of time. Paul, being taken from this prison, was beheaded outside the city wall of Rome. Two years after Paul's execution, on a hot summer night, a fire broke out in Rome. It started among the shops near the Circus Maximus and burned uncontrollably for six days. When the smoke had cleared, a large part of Rome lay in the ashes. Rumors swirled that Nero had caused the fire. For some time, Nero had wanted to tear down a third of the city of Rome to build a series of palaces called the Neropolis, but the Senate had opposed him. Now, with the city in ashes, he could pursue his ambitions. 
As the rumor spread that he had caused the fire, he began looking for a scapegoat and his gaze fixed on the Christians. Persecution spread across the empire. Pleasure-seeking crowds, craving excitement and entertainment, flocked to amphitheaters and coliseums where gladiators fought to the death and starving wild beasts attacked armed men. It's hard to imagine that this weed-infested field used to be the Circus Maximus of Rome. Around the outside of this field, over 250,000 people would gather. But it's what happened in between the chariot races that I find most fascinating. An altar would be set up, and Christians would be dragged before this altar and forced to make the ultimate choice. Who were they going to follow? God or the Emperor? With just a pinch of incense, they could save their lives. But these Christians would not compromise. Instead, they chose to die one of the most horrible deaths that can be imagined. One elderly man, Polycarp, a leader in the early Christian church, was dragged into an amphitheater filled with thousands of bloodthirsty people. The atmosphere changed as they watched this aged man brought before the pagan altar in the center. The proconsul, wishing to save his life, offered him his freedom if he would just put a pinch of incense on the altar. But Polycarp refused. Eighty and six years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I deny my Lord now? He chose to die. The fire was lit, but the wind blew the flames away from him. As the crowd began to express their sympathy, a soldier stepped forward and thrust a spear into his side. The impact on the onlookers as they watched these early Christians die was evident. It is said that the blood of martyrs is seed, and when one died, many more would spring up to take their place. Over the next 200 years, persecution of Christians continued in various parts of the Roman Empire. But in 284 AD, as Diocletian came to power, Christians were to face the worst persecution they had endured yet. The Roman Empire was on the verge of collapse. Diocletian tried to strengthen the empire by reviving practices of the ancient Roman religion, paganism. Christianity was outlawed. Intense persecution across the empire took place from 303 to 313 AD. As the terrible persecution raged on, a new emperor came to power who would change the Roman Empire forever. Christianity was about to face its greatest change and its most dangerous enemy. Light was about to become shackled. The turning point came as Constantine prepared to battle with Maxentius, a rival for the throne. The day before the battle, he claimed to have had a vision of the Christ and to have heard the words, In this sign thou shalt conquer. Being a man of action, he went back to his troops and had them put the sign of the cross on their shields and also make it one of their standards to be carried into battle. The next day, as Constantine's armies marched towards Maxentius, the enemy broke ranks and fled, and Maxentius himself drowned in the river here below. This convinced Constantine that Christianity was the true religion. He had his soldiers marched through the river and told all of them that they were now baptized Christians. And he himself claimed to have become a follower of Jesus Christ. As the sun set on that momentous day, few realized what had just happened. Constantine and Rome were embracing Christianity. The world would never be the same again. In 330 AD, Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire to a strategic location in the east. He named the city after himself, calling it Constantinople. Today, it is known as Istanbul, Turkey. For nearly eight centuries, Constantinople was the wealthiest and largest city in Europe. It was credited with having the most advanced defenses of any city in the empire. Constantine also issued the Edict of Milan, which legalized Christianity and supported those who practiced it. He also mandated that Sunday should become a universal day for rest and worship across the empire rather than Saturday kept by the Jews and the apostles. 
As controversies developed in Christianity, a shift began to take place. Rather than searching the scriptures for the truth, the church councils, or the emperor himself, decided the beliefs and doctrines for the church. These teachings often conflicted with the Bible. Over the following centuries, a major rift began to form. Those who refused to allow others to determine their biblical beliefs continued to be persecuted, and the church split into the state-endorsed church and an underground movement of believers scattered across Europe. The Roman Empire had stood for centuries, but was deteriorating from within and being attacked by barbarian invaders from without. Rome could no longer withstand the pressure, and it finally collapsed. As the empire declined, the church in Rome rose to prominence and power in its place. As the fifth century came to a close, a fundamental shift was taking place within Rome. Once the pagan political superpower, it was now becoming the center of Christianity within Europe. We call the period of time following this collapse the Dark Ages. Roaming tribes of bandits and barbarians pillaged the countryside. Roads became overgrown with weeds. Without proper maintenance, the aqueducts ceased to carry water into the cities and the streets overflowed with sewer. As raw material became scarce, people pillaged the Colosseums, temples, and theaters for stones to build their houses. Smallpox, <laughs> dysentery, and the plague ravaged the land in waves, sometimes wiping out up to half of the population. As barbarian tribes were settling in Western Europe, Clovis, a powerful king of the Franks, adopted the Christian faith. This was significant, as barbarians were pagan, not Christian. Thousands of his subjects followed his example and were baptized as Christians. He even allowed his army to fight for the Bishop of Rome. Christianity appeared to be gaining ground rapidly. While Christianity was rising in the West, dramatic changes were taking place in the eastern city of Constantinople. The night of July 31st, 528, Justinian the Great was on the verge of taking the throne after the death of his father, Justin. That night, he had a dream of a universal empire with one state, one law, and one church which ruled them all. Justinian determined to make this dream a reality while he was emperor. Five years later, Justinian passed the Corpus Juris Civilis, overhauling the Roman legal code. For the first time in history, Christianity was the mandated law of the land, and all dissenting views were to be persecuted. The Codus Justinianus mandated the following, that reading the Bible for anyone but the clergy was forbidden, that only the state church could conduct baptisms, that heretics were forbidden to gather for worship, and that the property of heretics could be confiscated by the church, and finally, that all magistrates and soldiers must swear that they are members of the church. It's hard to imagine that those who had endured such horrific persecution for hundreds of years were now the persecutors. The light was being shackled away from the people by the edicts of men. Meanwhile, back in the Western Empire, the city of Rome had fallen to the barbarian tribe of the Ostrogoths. They did not recognize Justinian's laws and also refused many of the tenants of the Roman state church. In the winter of 537, Justinian with his general Belisarius arrived to liberate Rome. By the end of 538, Rome was freed from the Ostrogoths and the Codus Justinianus became the law of the entire Roman Empire. The religious freedoms once enjoyed under the Ostrogoths were now lost and persecution began to rise for the first time from inside the Christian church. For the next 1260 years, from the years 538 to 1798, 
the state church became both a political and religious authority within Christendom. Ornate cathedrals were built, convents and monasteries multiplied and became the center of education within Europe. While the Bible was copied and transcribed by monks and religious scholars, it was locked away from the common person. Scriptures were translated into Latin, the language of the highly educated. Only the priest, monks, and scholars were believed to be holy enough to read and interpret the scriptures. Tradition and edicts of councils became the basis of authority. In the 8th century, Charlemagne became king of the Franks. Through military conquest and an alliance with the state church, he consolidated his power. In 782 AD, he issued an edict condemning to death any pagan who did not convert to Christianity. On December 25, in the year 800, Pope Leo III crowned Charlemagne Emperor of the Western Roman Empire. In doing this, the Pope demonstrated the Church had superior authority. The Church was not only cooperating with the state, it was superseding state power. Another example of the Church's power over the state is seen in the story of Henry IV in the 11th century. A church council further limited imperial authority, and when Henry objected, the Pope threatened him with excommunication. Under this threat, his nobles were unwilling to support his rule. In the middle of the winter of 1077, Henry traveled over the Alps toward the castle of Canossa where Pope Gregory VII was staying. Standing outside the castle gate, barefoot in the snow, King Henry waited for three days as penance before being admitted to beg pardon from the Pope. The Church was the most powerful institution in Europe, and it was willing to demonstrate this authority to advance its purposes. But the light was not wholly extinguished. Small groups of believers, hidden in the Italian Alps, kept the Bible alive in their language. They carried the Bible through centuries of bitter persecution and spread its light across Europe. These were the people who kept the flickering flame of truth shining in the darkness of their age. These were the Waldensians. The Waldensians were a small band of believers living here in the shadow of the Italian Alps. Having been evangelized in the time of the apostles, they carefully preserved precious truths that had been taught to them from the Bible. As much of Europe fell under the shadow of the state church, the Waldensians became the focus of intense indoctrination. The state church assumed the authority to mandate the beliefs and practices of all believers. She was to be the conscience of society. As a result, most of Europe, without the ability to compare church teachings with scripture, succumbed to superstition. They lived in fear of a stern God, supernatural activity, and also fear of the judgment. But the Waldensians had none of these fears as they had discovered the loving God of the Bible. Industrious and generous, the Waldensians were farmers, shepherds, and craftsmen. They spent many hours transforming these rocky mountains into fertile lands bursting with flowers and vegetation. Often, after a hard day's work, they would gather together to read the Bible, sing songs, or memorize large passages of the scriptures. The Waldensians were strong believers in biblical education. They built this school, the College of the Barbs, to train their young men in the scriptures. Here, they would memorize and transcribe large portions of the Bible. Not content to keep their knowledge of the Bible to themselves, they felt compelled to lead others out of darkness into the light of God's Word. Each school would be composed of 10 to 12 young people who were carefully educated to prepare them for missionary service. 
Here in this school, elders instructed them in the teachings of Scripture and the art of sharing it with others. Upon completion, they would travel across Europe as craftsmen and merchants, carrying the precious truth of the Bible with them. Some went as students to prestigious university towns such as Oxford, Prague, or Paris as secret missionaries to share the Bible with those interested. Because Bibles were outlawed, they carefully sewed pages of scripture in their clothes and between layers of their coats and looked for individuals that might be receptive to the gospel. But this was dangerous work. It was hard to know who you could trust. Was the person you were talking to genuinely interested? Or was it a priest trying to catch you? One mistake or misspoken word in the presence of the wrong person could lead to your imprisonment, torture, or death. Being a member of the underground church was risky. The relations between the state church and the Waldenses were tense. The Waldenses rejected the mysticism of the communion service, refused to confess sins to a priest, as the Bible taught that only God could forgive sins. They practiced baptism of adults instead of infants, and perhaps most surprisingly, worshipped on the seventh-day Sabbath of the Bible, just as the apostles who evangelized their valleys in the first centuries had done. By the year 1160, the state church condemned the Waldenses as heretics and demanded that they either recant their beliefs and come in line with the teachings of the church or face its wrath. The Waldenses refused to compromise. The response was a call for the extermination of these peaceful mountain people. Instead of pointing people back to the Bible as a source of truth, the church pointed the sword. In 1209, Pope Innocent III called for a crusade against the Waldenses and a related group of believers in the south of France, the Albigenses. What followed was a horrific slaughter. When asked by the soldiers what should be done with the refugees streaming from the besieged city of Bazier, the papal legate responded, kill them all, God will sort his own. The entire population, up to 30,000 people, were massacred. Centuries of relentless persecution nearly wiped them out. Armies spurred on by priests marched through these valleys, raiding and plundering homes. Bibles were burned, farmland destroyed, and bodies lay strewn across the ground. At a moment's notice, the Waldenses had to be ready to flee up these mountain paths deep into the Alps. As the enemy approached, they hid their families in caves or behind massive mountain bulwarks. The landscape was a natural defense against the soldiers, but the Waldenses were not always able to escape their enemies. In one raid, over a thousand Waldensians were marched to the top of this mountain. Men, women, and children were then thrown over the Castelluzzo to their deaths below. Often, small bands of believers would gather in secluded forests or hidden caves for worship. Many times, they would be discovered and brutally murdered. In the year 1655, the Duke of Savoy determined to put an end to these heretics. In the dead of winter, he ordered the Waldensians to attend Mass or move to the upper valleys of their homeland. He expected that they would give in to the order rather than face the freezing snow and cold. Over 12,000 people abandoned their homes and fled to the upper valleys. Men, women, children, and even the sick waded across the icy streams, ascended the frozen peaks before arriving in the upper valleys where they were warmly received. Thwarted in his purpose, the Duke then chose to use trickery. On April 24, 1655, he asked the Waldensians to temporarily house his soldiers. Being loyal citizens, they consented, 
and garrisoned thousands of soldiers in their homes all through the valley. After a few days, at 4 a.m. on Easter morning, the soldiers turned against their host, slaughtering, imprisoning, and torturing them mercilessly. Over 1,700 Waldensians were killed, thousands more were imprisoned, and many starved to death. The survivors were given two options, either convert or leave the country immediately. Unwilling to compromise, they climbed over the frozen Alps to find refuge in Switzerland. As news of the massacre spread, people responded with horror and indignation. Protestant countries opened their borders and offered asylum to the remaining Waldensians. Oliver Cromwell, who is Lord Protector in London, began petitioning on their behalf, he began writing letters, raising funds, calling a day of fasting and prayer, and even threatening military force to come and rescue them. I have to wonder, which of their beliefs brought so much persecution? Was it because they believed in a personal God? Or perhaps because they refused to confess their sins to a man? Or maybe it was because they had the Bible in their own language? Whatever it was, the Waldensians were mercilessly slaughtered. There was a widening gap between the wealthy and the poor. The rich made their fortunes off the sweat of the working class, offering minimal protection in return for their labors. For the poor, the struggle to survive was nearly all-consuming. Books were rare, as they had to be copied by hand, and most of the common people were illiterate. Stained glass windows and ornate statues in the churches were the only instructions many had in the stories of the Bible. Services in Latin held little practical meaning for the worshipers, who could not even read in their own language. The state church rose to the zenith of power. No other authority held her accountable. She claimed power over kings and rulers, and even above the requirements and laws of Scripture. Money became the lifeblood of the church. Multi-century construction projects valued in the millions were undertaken to build great cathedrals. Positions of spiritual leadership and influence were at times given to the highest bidder. Europe was in desperate need of change. People wondered if anything could stop the tide of corruption. The darkness was so deep you thought there was a way out. It was time for change. It was time for the morning star of the Reformation. <laughs>